I have a confession to make here this morning. Um, I have a an ability, without even recognizing it or realizing it, to pick up other people's accents. Okay, let me explain what I mean by this. With the exception of a few, like, sorry, Vincent and Nelly, no matter how hard I try, I don't think I'm going to get that one. But what I mean by that is, is sometimes I get around people, and I start talking, and they start talking to me, and for some reason I start talking like them. And I realize that it could even be something where now they think I'm mimicking them, like I'm being, you know, rude or something like that. I had a big corporate meeting this, this week at my work, and um, we were meeting with a company from Canada. And so I was sitting in this, in this meeting with a group of folks from Canada, Canadians, right? And they're talking to me, and usually in their sentences, and this is not to be stereotypical or anything like that, it just happened to be the group that I was with, they would say something like, so you've got animals, yes, A, eh? A, eh? and everything's yes, A, eh? right, A, eh? yes, right, A. Eh? And so I'm listening to them, and then I start repeating back to them. I'm like, yeah, so I've got bearded dragons, eh? And I've got some crested geckos, eh? And I've got, and they're like, they start looking at me like, are you Canadian or something? And I'm like, I'm like, no, no I'm not. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know why I do this, right? If you're from New York, I actually grew up in New York. If you're from New York and you come around me, you start talking to me, just know that I actually was, I did spend some time in New York. I'm not making fun of your accent. I will pick it up. My wife is a joke every once in a while. I'll say, hey, babe, can I get a cup of coffee? And she goes, I can get you coffee if you'd like. But we don't we don't have coffee in the house. Very nice. I went to a school and the, uh, was at a Christian university. A bunch of guys from from the south and Bible Belt areas come around. And if you start, you know, we went out to a rodeo I think a while back ago, and, and I was talking to some people, and all of a sudden, you know, some southern folks out there, some some people with some twang in their voice, and I I guess it just flows out of me. The reason why I bring this up, guys, is because so too, when we get around the Lord and we get around His grace and mercy, it has a way of transforming us. It has a way of changing who we are. Today we're going to be talking about how it is that the Lord alters us, okay, and you could put an A-L-T-A-R on that, but how the Lord changes us through His grace and mercy. Because as we've gone through the book of Hebrews, if you remember when we started in this book, I told you, I warned you, right, that the purpose of Paul's writings here in the book of Hebrews was to bring Christians into a place of maturity. To move them from a place of just, you know, I've got my fire insurance now, to a place of, well, now I'm, I'm walking with the Lord in a way that pleases and honors Him because I've been transformed by His grace and mercy. Walking with God is manifested, guys, in where we travel, in what we do, and how we conduct ourselves. Yesterday I was having a conversation with somebody in an outreach, at the, uh, at the Green Market outreach, and they're, it spurred on a discussion on how it is that we are changed, and why it is that we're changed. And this person believed that we need to change ourselves, that we need to work really, really hard in transforming and changing our character, our actions, our deeds, so that we could then earn God's grace and favor. Okay, and he's very vocal about it. He said it, he was very direct with me. He says, uh, "You got to change your life if you want God's grace and mercy in it." And I said, "Well, th I, I believe that there's a difference in what we believe. You see, I don't believe that a person changes their life to receive grace and mercy. I believe that a person's life is changed from a place of grace and mercy. So, in other words, when you ask Christ into your life, your life is transformed by God's grace." Proverbs chapter 16, verse 2 says this, All the ways of man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. I like that. All the ways of man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. And if you're underlining the word sp or, or spirit, you can also put conscience, motive. Okay? It's really important because if we take on the position right, that God is presenting us, offering us His grace and mercy because of the good things that we do, we run into a problem. The problem is, is that at the end of the day, the Bible says that, that our righteous deeds are but filthy rags. No matter how hard we work at this thing called grace, no matter how hard we work for God's salvation, for God's mercy, for His forgiveness in our life, it'll never come about because there's one big issue. Okay, It's not just the outward action, 
the inward heart, right? You can change the way you do things. Uh, I'll give you an example. Young guys, when they are looking to win the affections of a woman, have a tendency to change certain mannerisms, right? Certain behaviors that may exist, okay? That their family knows about, their good friends know about, but that poor woman has no idea of yet, right? He changes the way. All of a sudden, he's, he's chivalrous, right? He knows how to open a door. He knows how to pull out a chair. He knows how to get gifts. He knows how to say excuse me or, or not even say excuse me because he doesn't burp or do any of that gross stuff in front of her all of a sudden, right? And then, after they get married, all of a sudden, this poor, poor woman is exposed to the reality of what she just got involved with, right? But if there is love in the relationship, if there is a true dedication and devotion, while he may have changed certain behaviors at the beginning to earn the affection, if there's a real relationship, from that place of the relationship begins a real transformation and change. Okay? It, it could be as, as simple as lifting up a toilet seat, or it could be as simple as remembering certain dates, right? Before you remember dates because you wanted something, you hoped to gain something, but afterwards, you remember these things because there is a true and deep devotion. So too, God is not going to be impressed. I told this to somebody yesterday. I said, you realize God made everything. They go, absolutely, God made everything. In seven days, God made everything. Absolutely. The universe, the, the stars in the heavens, all of these things. God made everything around you. Are you impressed? Just look at the scenery right now. Are you impressed by God's creation? Now answer me this question. What good deed is going to impress the guy or impress the God who created the stars with his hands? What, is, what charitable deed are you going to do that God's going to go, I can't believe it. I'm so impressed. Look at the work that you've done. Look at all the heart. No. It's ridiculous to think something like that. And now we get into, if you would, please, look with me here at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 10. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. Christian, believer, this is for you, church. You have an altar that you could partake of, that you can enjoy from, that those who serve the tabernacle do not get to eat from. You say, what does that mean, Pastor Ryan? Well, what it means is this. There are people who serve the deed, who serve the action, but don't serve the God. You see, here is Paul telling the church, don't confuse the two. Those people, they serve the tabernacle, but they're not eating from the right altar. You see, the priests had an opportunity after they gave over a burnt offering, after they presented a burnt offering to the Lord, that they could then receive from it food and nourishment for themselves. It was part of their provision. So too as Christians, do you realize that we have something that we receive from the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? We have hope. We have peace. We have eternity. We have everlasting life. We get to partake of these things, and we had nothing to do with the sacrifice. And if you just worship the altar, if you just worship the tabernacle, if you just worship the sacrifice, if you just worship the deed, you miss it. Because now you're not enjoying the sacrifice that was provided for you. Guys, I'm going to say something that might offend some, and I'm okay with that because I do that quite often. All right, but I want to share this. You cannot do a single good thing, not a single good thing, apart from Jesus Christ. It doesn't exist. You say, wait a second, Pastor Ryan, that is offensive. Lots of good things. You can join, you know, Greenpeace, or you can go join, you know, UNICEF, or you can go become a humanitarian. People that don't believe in God do good things. No, they don't. They absolutely do not. And the only reason why God says that the things that you do, his service, your service to him is good or pleasing, is because you've been covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You see, you have to understand, Christian, you're only righteous because of Christ. That's the only reason why God looks at you and says you've been justified, you've been made righteous. The only reason why you get to partake of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is is because you had nothing to do with presenting it. It's all his. And he says, listen, do you want eternity? Do you want forgiveness? Do you want mercy? Do you want grace? Then stop worshiping the things or the deeds that you believe will present you with 
eternity and salvation and start worshiping the one who does present you with them. Thus we serve from a place not for sacrifice, but from it. Thus God begins in us to transform us because we have received the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. You guys realize that an interaction, a meeting with God, absolutely transforms you. If you don't, turn with me to Genesis. Genesis chapter 32, and let me tell you, or let the scriptures tell you a story of one such interaction. A true interaction with God will transform your walk and make it evident to the world that you haven't made, have had an encounter with God. We get sales calls at my work quite frequently. It's a business. It's something unusual. And I love some of the sales calls because sales folks, and if you're in sales, I, you know, I apologize if you've called my business and we, we play games sometimes back and forth, all right? Um, but they've become very crafty and creative. Do you guys ever get like calls on your cell phone now that has your the, the area code and you're like, oh, this must be somebody I know because it's got like 561 or 954. You answer it and it's a salesperson. It's like, you got me again. I can't believe it, right? So we get a call from uh, on a frequent basis to my work and somebody will say, hey, listen, I'm good friends with Rain. Now, my boss's name is Ryan, just like my name, except except he spells it incorrectly, okay? He spells it R-I-A-N. I spell it the right way, which is R-Y-A-N, okay? So people call up and say, listen, I'm good friends with Rain. Can I speak with him? I've known Rain for years. And I always reply with, you must have known him before me because I've only ever known him as Ryan. So you must be really good friends with him. You must have known him when he went by the name Rain or something like that because I've never known him. And then it gets real quiet. And I was like, are you trying to sell us something? Well, and I can't talk right now. Thank you. When we interact with God, the world will see if it's genuine or not. It will be reflected in your words. It will be reflected in your deeds. I hate, I hate, 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 hate plastic and pretend Christianity. I hate when folks feel the necessity to put a fake smile on their face because that's what Christians do. Show up to church on Sunday. Hey, how's everything going? Oh, good. Praise the Lord. It's great. Yeah, how's your marriage doing? Falling apart, but praise the Lord. It's still good, you know. How, how's the kids doing? Oh, they don't listen to a single thing I tell them to do, but praise God. Everything's good, you know. Bill's getting paid. No, nothing's getting paid. Praise God. I just, you know. And they don't even mean it. They just think like, and I'm okay with people who go through difficulty praising the Lord in the midst of difficulty. I mean, that's, that's, that's honoring to the Lord. Okay, that shows that you understand the sovereignty and you trust God's purpose and plans. But don't be fake about it, right? Don't be somebody that's, oh, yeah, I don't know what to say. You're just gonna. That's what Christians do, right? We just smile all the time. I got a bumper sticker. I put it on the car this morning. Yeah, you know. Look with me in Genesis chapter 32, verse 23. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him, and he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, What is it that you ask about my name? I'm sorry, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have been for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Let me get your attention. Why I share that area of scripture with us is because again it reaffirms the truth of God's word that an interaction with God is transformative. Here's a guy, Jacob. Name means supplanter, heel catcher, right? A liar, a thief. He's stolen. He's tricked people. His whole life has been dedicated to number one, himself. And here he has this interaction with God. And as he interacts with God, he wrestles with God, it says. He struggles with the Lord. And as he struggles with the Lord, the Lord says to him, finally, what is it that you want? And he says, I just, I won't, I won't leave until you bless me. 
And God not only blesses him, but he transforms him. And he says, listen, from this day forward, from this day forward, you're not going to be heel catcher. You're not going to be supplanter. You're not going to be the guy that you were or the guy that you were before. You're going to be somebody who is a prince, a governor, or a governor, or somebody governed by God. That's who you're going to be from now on. And I know I love this part, part because it, sometimes we miss it in the in the uh, translation. But here Jacob says to him, "Now tell me your name." And he says, "Why do you ask my name?" And it's kind of a sarcastic thing because he knows that Jacob knows exactly who he's been wrestling with. Because afterwards, Jacob names the place Peniel, which means I've seen God face to face. Right? He knows exactly who he's been wrestling with, who he's been struggling with. For those of you guys here, you know exactly how God's been trying to transform your life, how he's been trying to get a hold of you, how he's been trying to grab a hold of your heart and some of the things that are going on in your life and transform them and you continue to wrestle and you continue to wrestle. And it's not until you give up. It's not until you come to a place where you go, God, I'm just holding on to you. I'm not going to fight with you, but I'm holding on to you. Wherever you lead me, wherever you take me, that's where I'm going to go. That's when you get transformed. That's when you get changed and altered. Because from that day forward, Jacob walked around with a limp. Note with me, God knocks his hip out of socket, and he doesn't heal it perfectly. He walks around with a limp from that day forward. Everybody who saw Jacob would be like, hey, what happened to you? What, tra- what changed about you? And there was an opportunity for Jacob to share with them, I had an interaction with God. I had an encounter with God. I was transformed by God's grace and mercy. Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, at the beginning of writing to Titus, makes this very interesting statement. He says, the acknowledgement of truth, which accords with godliness. When you acknowledge truth, godliness will follow. When you receive truth into your life from God's word, godliness will follow. You will look more and more like the Lord. That's why, believer, Christian, Guys, this is why I tell you, you got to get into your word every single day. Because as you have more and more encounters with the truth of God's word, it will transform and change you. It's not about memorizing some verses. It's about having the word of God transform and alter your life. Look with me back at Hebrews chapter 13, now back now in verse 11. It says, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus, also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name, but do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Guys, I want you to know that God has called every person in here who has been transformed, who has received the grace of Christ, who has received the grace of God in their life, has called you to full-time ministry. Okay. Now, if you uh, want to know how much you're going to get paid for that full-time ministry, just get take whatever you're getting paid now for full-time ministry and multiply that by zero. Okay, that's it. I'm not promising you a position here at the church. What I'm telling you is that wherever God leads you and sends you is exactly where He wants you to minister. He has you in church today. He wants you to minister. When you go out to lunch or whatever you do after this, He wants you to continue to minister. He wants you to be transformed and make that transformation evident. And use that that transformation as an opportunity for ministry. Note with me this, though. In the process of getting us ready for full-time ministry, what's one of the first things he does? He takes the trash outside the camp. He takes what was wrong. He takes the issues okay, that we've held on to, the baggage that we cling to. And he says, listen, part of the process that comes after salvation is a word that we like to refer to as sanctification. And sanctification is the process of taking those sins, those things that held you in bondage for so long, and bringing it outside the camp and doing away with it. The altar was the killing place, is what the word means. A place that stuff goes to die. All right. And if you continue to struggle and you continue to find yourself in bondage to sin, bring it to Jesus outside the camp, bring it to Jesus, And he'll kill it. He'll put it on the altar. Leave it there. Don't come back for it. 
Psalm chapter 103, verse 12 says this, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. God takes the garbage in our life. He wants to set it outside the camp. He wants to set it outside of your life. He doesn't want you to be in bondage to it any longer. And here, note with me this, starting in verse 13, it says, Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. God is saying, listen, part of our full-time ministry, it starts with the sanctifying process, but then we follow suit outside the camp. It's interesting to know that Jesus ministered to people a lot of times outside of what? Outside of the formal places of ministry, right? Outside of the temple. It's interesting to note as you read through the life of Jesus Christ, most of his ministry takes place outside of the temple, outside of the synagogues. Why is that? Because the people out there need to see the grace of God. God has entrusted us as his ambassadors with an opportunity to bring the grace and the mercy and the message of the gospel outside of the camp. It's easy to praise Jesus in here, right? Nobody's like, well, listen, it's not strange in church to see people raising up their hands to Jesus, worshiping Jesus, reading the Bible. Now go do that outside, though. Because those are the people that really need to see it. Those are the people that really need to hear it. We come in here to refresh, to strengthen, to sharpen one another. But the reason why God does that is not to, it's not to create a Christian Disneyland or Walmart. It's not to create a place where everything's there and available and we don't have to really travel outside of it. A lot of churches nowadays, their, their desire is to make this here everything. I can go eat at church. I can go get my coffee at church. I can go work at church. I can go do... Listen, I don't ever have to leave church. I can go to sleep at church. I mean, they have everything I can... Why ever go out into the world? Why ever go interact with those people out there? They don't understand me. They don't like me. They judge me. They're mean to me. They say horrible things about... It's okay, because they're the ones that need it. God says, listen, follow me. I went outside the camp. I brought sin outside the camp. I dealt with these issues outside the camp. So too, believer, God is calling you outside the camp. Go minister to the lost. Go minister to the hurting. Go minister to the people that nobody else wants to touch or talk to. I want to see, I've shared this before, I believe that this church is in a season where God is, has been growing it. Okay, And I believe he's going to continue to do so. But I'm not interested in growing this church with people who just left another church and they just bounce around from church to church or, 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 or grow this church with people who, who we've convinced somehow like our coffee is better than their coffee kind of thing, you know? Who's said, our pastor's cooler than your pastor, so you should come to our church. No, I'm interested in seeing this church grow with people who don't know Jesus Christ and who don't go to church. That's what we want to do. That's the people that we want to invite and encourage to come out and be a part of the ministry and the work that God's doing here. Matthew chapter 28. I'm sure you guys are very familiar with it. Verse 19. Jesus is one of his final commands, one of his final instructions to the disciples. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I command you. And lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. God is with you, and he wants to send you out into the world to share the gospel and to make disciples of everybody that you come in contact with. You know, there's no, I shared this last week, there's no target audience for the gospel. A lot of churches, well, it's our target audience. You know, are we a young church? Are we an old church? Are we a Hispanic church? Are we a black church? Are we a white? What kind of church? Are we a rich church? Are we a poor church? What kind of church are we? We've got to hit our target audience. There's no target audience in the, in the kingdom of heaven. It's everybody. Go there for everybody. Somebody you interact with, share the gospel. I don't know if they'll really fit into our church. I think they're looking for a singles ministry. And Pastor Ryan, we haven't started a singles ministry yet at our church, and we probably won't because, you know, we're not Match.com, all right? Sorry. Guys, preach the gospel to everybody. There's not a single person on this planet that doesn't need the gospel. There's not a single person in existence that didn't need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. 
There's not a single person in existence that God can't reach and minister to through the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't care how hard their heart is. God transformed murderers, transformed unbelievers. He transformed everybody and everybody. It's not through your work. It's not through your ability or your skills. It's through the power of Jesus Christ. Look with me now at verse 17. I was excited to get to this one, guys. Some of y'all read ahead. You're like, man, that's not cool, Pastor Ryan. (laughs) Obey. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable to you. Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. You want to be altered if you want to be transformed and changed by the Lord. There's a question that you also need to ask yourself in the process. Are you looking to be a servant or a star? I wrote down, I wonder if, if so many new ministries are the result of God's leading or a desire for people who have a desire for a leading role. Is it God leading you to start a ministry or is it that you just don't like people telling you what to do? Because that's oftentimes the heart, if we're being honest, behind new ministries and new ideas. It's like, listen, I would love to go start a church because I don't want to listen to other people who tell me how to conduct myself in church. I'll just go be the big shot. I'll be the big guy, and then I'll do it myself, right? I I don't want to serve in this ministry. I'll just go start my own ministry. It looks an awful lot like this ministry at the church. No, it's different because I'm in charge. That's why, right? Note with me here, Paul's saying, listen, guys, obey those who have been placed in a position of authority over you. You know why? Because it makes life so much easier. Because it makes things so much easier. In my household, when my kids obey, things go great. I love it, right? When they're screaming and yelling and refuse to listen to a single thing, man, things get tough, right? Guys, listen, I just want I want a nice day. Daddy doesn't like punishing people. He doesn't like giving spankings. It's not his favorite thing to do in the world. Please, just listen. Just let the leaders do the leading. And if you want to be in a position of leadership, guess what? Every leader is a servant. And if you want to be a really good leader, the first thing that you need to learn how to do is be a really, really good servant. Jesus even told his disciples, listen, the first will be last and the last will be first. If you want to be in leadership, I love, I want everybody, I want a a church full of leadership, okay? Everybody doing ministry, serving, leading people to Jesus Christ. And that comes with people submitting and serving under one another. Honor the overseers. I remember when I was younger, I went out camping, and uh, I was doing some horse riding um, with a group. And I, we were doing what's called uh, trail riding. Okay, So you have horses, and you have them in a line. And different horses, actually, they tell you this. And Mary Ellen, correct me if I'm wrong, because she does horses. She, does, she knows about those things. right? Anyways, um, the trail horses, they learn who's to be the head. There's always one. It's the same trail horse, the lead horse. Thank you. See, I don't even know the word. The lead horse needs to be at the front. What happens is sometimes one of the other horses get this grand idea, like I'm going to go be the lead horse. And they tell you, don't let your horse go in front of the other horses or try to get around them because that that makes the lead horse very angry. Okay. So I got the lead horse. I was excited about that. right? Because also the lead horse at the end, they get to gallop at the end. They get to run fast. I was excited about that. So I get the lead horse, and this guy who I'm with, he doesn't want his horse behind my horse. He wants to bring his horse to the lead, and his horse evidently had the same heart as he did, and he wanted to be the lead. And I could feel my horse literally tensing up. My my horse was getting agitated, and I said, dude, you got to stop, please. Please stop. My horse is getting angry. I could tell, you know, it was like Mr. Ed, he was telling me these things or something, but it's getting mad, man. And he's like, no, no, it's fine. And he goes to go alongside of me, and that horse rears and kicks his horse, kicks him, and kicks the saddle, and actually kicks the kid's leg, and the saddle comes loose, and the kid falls off the horse, right? 
And then I look back and I say, I told you, bro, you messed up. You know, that saying that I tell everybody, play stupid games, you win stupid prizes, you know, enjoy that. All right? Listen, this is not about me enjoying the leadership. Pastor Ryan, are you telling us that how dare anybody question your authority or your leadership? I'm not telling you to respect the person. I'm asking you to understand that God wants us to respect the position that he's given out. To honor every position that God has put in place. To honor the positions of authority. All right? Share with you guys another example, one that I sometimes get some flack for, but I don't mind it. Guys, the Bible says to honor those in positions of government. Honor the governing authorities, right? Rulers. Okay? Now, I like this because people forget at the time in which the Bible was being written and the things that were going on. These people were being persecuted, put to death. And God's telling the Christians, hey, listen, when you're in the world, make sure that you're honoring those in positions of authority. Okay? Now, I generally understand the demographic of most churches is fairly conservative. Um, I'm not here to talk about politics. But when people in positions of authority tend to be conservative, we're, as Christians, we're like, praise God, it's no problem. I'll submit all day long. When it's not, and you don't like the person in charge, all of a sudden, it's okay to speak disparagingly or to not show respect or reverence to a position that God has put somebody in, not you. Even David said, who am I to touch the Lord's anointed? Saul wasn't a good king, and David said, no problem. I'm not going to touch him. I'm not going to fight against him. That's who God put in position of authority. I'm not going to fight against him. But wait a second, David. God came to you, and he used a prophet, and he, and he anointed somebody, and he, and he, or he anointed you, and you're the new king. He goes, not until God puts me in that position. Who am I to touch the Lord's anointed? Guys, submission under authority, even in the church, it's about honoring the position and trusting in God's sovereignty and purpose. It's about knowing that God knows what he's doing. okay? And he didn't ask your advice and he didn't ask your opinion on it because he didn't need it, with all due respect. He knows exactly what he's doing. Psalm 32, verse 9 says this, Do not be like the horse or like a mule which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with a bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. Let me be practical for a minute, too. You guys realize that pastors are people, too? Right? I'm a human being. And what I'm saying when I say that is this. If I haven't offended you yet, and I've tried really hard today, okay? If I haven't offended you yet, stick around. I promise it will eventually come about. It might not be through a message. I might forget to say hello to you one day. I might forget to give you a call. I might leave you off a text devotion or something that I was supposed to do or I didn't start a ministry. To, just, just give it some time. But I share that with you because Paul here says, listen, please, for the sake of the ministry moving smoothly, for the sake of things going well, understand that these people who I've put in positions of authority, unless they're heretics, Unless they're teaching something that is unbiblical and ungodly, please, for the sake of unity, just respect the authority. Obey what it is that they're saying. Do what it is. That, why? Because, listen, it's just not that big of a deal. Who's in charge? Is it them or is it me? Well, it's you, God. But then, listen, dwell with them and understand it. Love on them. Pray for them. Notice with me what Paul's saying. Pray for us. For we are confident that we have that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably. That word for good conscience in the Greek is synodesis. It means able to distinguish good and evil. You need to pray for your pastors, for your leaders, for those in positions of authority at the church, because you don't want them to get burnt out. You don't want them to become somebody that's bitter and angry because they're constantly struggling with people inside the church. You don't want them to become somebody who can no longer, as Paul says, distinguish between good and evil because the enemy is after your leaders. Not just here in the church, but also at your workplace and in your home. The enemy is always after leaders. Why? Because you take out the head and the rest scatter, right? Pray for those in position of authority. Even those who you really want to just strangle some days, okay? Even those who don't respect your ideas or, or give you the consideration and the honor that you are, you are so rightly due, pray for them because they need it. 
because the enemy is after them and he's after your testimony and witness when you rebel against them too. Because that's who gets hurt. Right? When the world looks on and sees another church split, when the world looks on and sees another pastor fall, another moral failing, another issue at the church, right? Pray for them. Another burnt out, angry person, pray for them. Man, we needed help in this ministry. It got left undone. Somebody new comes to church, and now the well, I guess that's how churches run themselves now, huh? You know? Pray for them. Come alongside of them. Yeah, I love you know that story of when Moses is uh, overseeing the battle. I think it's the battle of AI, if I'm not mistaken. You guys can look it up later. And make sure I'm I'm right here. But Moses has to lift his hands up, and as he lifts his hands up, the people have victory in battle, right? But then what happens? His arms start to get tired, and they start to fall down, right? Oh, man, tough day, hard day, right? And then who comes alongside of him? Aaron and Ben, right? Ben-Hur? Her, right? Ben-Hur? Not, not Ben-Hur. It was a joke. Bad joke. Anyways, her. Aaron and her, okay, come alongside. They lift up his arms. You know what I love? The fact that they didn't do? Moses, you should have been doing some more push-ups, bro. <laughs> should have been working on that upper body strength because you were only doing this for like five minutes, man. <laughs> really disappointed in you. That's right. You should have wrote down some more verses today. You should have been. Yeah, did you share with me? You share any verses with me this week? You text me any Bible verses? No, oh, that's your job, Pastor Brian. Oh, I appreciate that. I don't need encouragement, right? I don't need to be. I, I don't need to be prayed for. God, you know, it's it's fine. Of course not. Your leaders, you know, you really dropped the ball on the scheduling thing, Andrew. Children's ministry, another, messed it up again. You know, it's like thanks. Did you want to do it? No, I just wanted to criticize you for it. <laughs> Come alongside, pray, encourage. Guys, one of the ways that we show that we've been altered and transformed is by keeping our fellow servants, our fellow servants, sharp, refreshed, and encouraged. We need each other. We really do. Look with me now at verse 20. So the last area of Scripture we'll cover and we'll close. Verse 20. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation. For I have written to you in few words, know that our brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. Greet all those who rule over you and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Some of you guys are like, Amen. Finally, the book of Hebrews is over. <laughs> I love the practicality of what Paul has done in the book of Hebrews. He's taken us through doctrine and teachings and theology. And for, for some of us, it's taken a long time, okay? Appreciate those of you who have been here since the beginning. Um, he's taken us through these things. And now at the end, he's giving us these these practical nuggets of application, areas in our lives that we begin to show people how God has transformed us through his grace and mercy, right? And, and in the process, some of us have probably come to the place, I know I have, where you get these practical nuggets and you're like, I have no idea how I'm going to apply these things into my life. My life is such a mess right now. I struggle with the very simple aspect of just walking in God's grace and forgiveness and, and striving daily to just not do the same dumb thing I've done every week, right? I don't, I don't think you can add more onto my plate. It's overloaded. It's tipping over. And God says, listen, don't worry about that. Walk with me. Let me transform your life. You follow me, right? It's like when Peter, he had this great idea. He has this encounter with the Lord on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? He sees Moses and Elijah and Jesus. is this great scene. And all of a sudden, Peter has this great idea. You know what we need to do now? We need to build an altar. We'll build one for Moses. We'll build one for Elijah. We'll build one for you, Jesus. We're going to build three altars. This is a great idea. And God has to you know, step in and speak from heaven. And he goes, Peter, hear him, please. You know, it's God's way of saying, Shh, stop, no more, please, 
right? God's doing that with our hearts. He said, listen, don't worry about how this is going to happen. If you follow Jesus, it's going to happen. It's going to be transformed. Your life is going to be transformed. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. God says, listen, the work that I've called you to, it will be a complete work. It will be a fulfilled work. It will be a perfected work as so, so long as you walk with me and allow me to do the work of not only salvation, but now hopefully in the course of this study, guys, you've realized that God is wanting to do more than just save us. He's also wanting to sanctify us. He's wanting to make us holy and set us apart if we continue to follow Jesus. You followed and trusted him for your salvation. Now follow and trust him for your perfection, for your sanctification, for your completeness, for the fulfillment of the ministry that God has called you to do. Yes, it's daunting. Yes, it's beyond you. Yes, it's too big for you. But so too it was for these fishermen we're about to read in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. That's impressive, right? Talk about, a, uh, talk about a promotion, right? You go from catching fish, and now God's saying, listen, good job with the fish. Now let's go catch men. You go, Different species altogether. They run faster, all right? I don't know how we're going to catch them. Then immediately they left their nets and did what? Followed him. Going out from there, he saw two other brothers. They were also fishermen, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And their lives were transformed. He didn't take them on some six-week course, didn't put them in Bible college for four years, he didn't take them and tell them, hey, listen, these areas of your life, these are the areas you're going to have to fix and make ready first before I can use you in ministry. He goes, listen, put down what you're doing and follow me. You want to see your life transformed, your home transformed, your workplace transformed, your marriage, your relationship with your children? Just follow Jesus. And note with me, I love what the fishermen were doing. They were working on mending their nets. They were trying to fix things, perfect things, so that they could be better fishermen. And none of them said to Jesus, hey, wait a second, you want us to catch fishers of men? We have to have really good nets for this. Let me continue to fix my nets, then I'll get with you on that. I, need, I make the best nets around. You know, I don't know if you know this. My nets are top notch. Let me fix it. No, no, no. Jesus said, listen, put it down. Drop it. And they dropped it, and they started following Jesus. And he made them fishers of men. And he didn't tell them, hey, here's Fishers of Men Course 101. Today we're going to be talking about how... He... No, they followed Jesus. And where Jesus went, they went. And where Jesus led them that day, that's where they were led. And when Jesus provided an opportunity for them to pray over somebody, they prayed. And when they had an opportunity to share the gospel, they shared the gospel. You know, even when you read in the book of Acts, these men followed wherever God led. You know, Peter starts off in the temple. I think he had no idea who he was going to minister to that day. And there's a lame man begging for money, and he just goes, I wasn't trying to create a quote here, guys. Silver and gold I don't have, but what I have, I, I give to you. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the guy's life was transformed, not because Peter gave some really great speech on it, because he gave them what he actually had. and was able to show him personally, I actually have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you want the same, I'll give it to you. I'll show you where you can get it. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear also as delivered out of the mouth of a lion. I love that. I don't, you know, the, Whoever made the, by the way, the, um, the verses and chapters, those were added in later, guys. It was just one big letter. Whoever put that in there and made sure that was included into that verse, I love that, right? I think that was really cool of them. Here he is. is it, God is going to provide the opportunity for you to minister. He's going to strengthen you. He's going to walk with you in your ministry. And by the way, I survived the lion attack. You know, That's really cool. It's like almost like if you don't think God can walk with you and give you strength in your ministry, by the way, I survived the lion attack through the Lord. You know, How many of us can say the same thing? You don't think God can use you? By the way, here's how he uses you don't think God has a plan for your life or for your ministry? By the way, 
Let me tell you what he did with me. By the way, I'm amazed. I thought about this this morning as I was putting this together and last night, putting together teaching. I have, you know those memories that you have in your mind that are just so um, so clear, so, so is vivid the right word? It's just so crisp, so vivid. You, you remember them. You remember exactly what you were doing, the smells, the scenery. I remember one of my early church attendances, you know, the first time I went to a church kind of thing. I went out to a youth group, and as I pulled into the youth group, I remember, I'm not going to share it with you because I'm really embarrassed, I was listening to a Dr. Dre album. And I'm literally blasting it in my car because I, I, you know, I want everybody to know I really like this album and I'm cool, you know. <laughs> got my seat lowered back, got the windows down. I pull up the youth group, blasting it. And it wasn't the clean version, by the way, okay. So all this horrible, you know, filth is pouring out from my car and I showed up for church. And I'm thinking about this scene and I remember the looks. I remember the way people saw me. I was by myself. I didn't have a family that brought me into church. And now I'm the pastor of a church. By the way, by the way, if that doesn't blow your mind, think about your own life. Remember what you were doing 5, 10, 15 years ago, maybe last month, you know. Remember those things? By the way, God's got you listening to somebody talk to you about the Bible right now. God's got a mission for you when you leave this place. By the way, and here's how you're going to be able to complete it and fulfill it. Just walk with Jesus. Follow him. This is where the legalist in me starts rising up and gets worried, just like I was talking to the guy yesterday. Well, what about if people don't do what God wants them to do and live the life that God calls them to live? He'll lead them in the path that he wants them to. If they follow him. Right? If your life is transformed by grace, it will be evident. Okay? My life has been transformed by being married. I have commitments. I have work. I have jewelry. Right? I have 15 pounds. Okay? It's been transformed. There's no question. Okay? And my wife doesn't allow there to be questions. Okay? Transform. You want to have your life transformed? Walk with Jesus. That simple. It was that simple for the 12 who changed the world just by simply walking with him. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much that you have included us in your plans, that you have transformed and altered our lives, God, that you have given us opportunity to now go outside the camp with the same message and with the same transfer, transforming work that begun in us, God. We get to now go out and show the world. And I pray, Lord, May every person in here be saltier than when they walked in. May every person in here be a brighter light than they were when they first walked in. God, may each and every one of us shine brightly, remove the baskets, remove those things that hinder the grace of God from being seen in our lives and in our deeds and in our words. May all that we do bring you glory, honor, and praise. And God, we pray, may you give us strength and never forsake us on this journey. We know you won't. God, you've called us to minister, to be servants of the Most High King. And God, we do so with great joy and zeal and passion now. May you strengthen us and go with us, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. And guys, with everybody's eyes still closed, heads bowed, this is what we do and will continue to do. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, if this journey has not yet begun for you, if you don't identify or relate with the grace and mercy and the work of Jesus Christ, then here is your opportunity, your invitation this day. It's not from me, but it's from God. That if you would put your faith in Jesus Christ this moment, this day, that you would be granted eternity with him, forgiveness of sins, and that he would walk with you for the rest of your life. If you want to receive the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, simply pray this prayer, repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for them, that he rose three days later, and that he is God, and I pray that he would be the God, the master of my life. May you walk with me, Lord, from this day forward and into eternity. May I follow you and you alone. In 
Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.